All right, how to ask the questions. I mean, the obvious question to ask first off is, are you pre-approved? And what are they gonna say at that point? They're gonna say yes or no, probably. And um, if they say yes, then your response should be great. Then can I have your letter? You know, because they should have a pre-approval letter. And, you know, who's your lender? The question, Cindy, just yes. the, the pre-approval letter has to be how far back, Max? So they're technically valid for like three months, but um, it's very easy to get them renewed. There are some lenders that make you get uh, run your credit and give all your documents and everything else after the three months to get another to get a renewal. I don't do any of that. I think that's ridiculous. Unless something has changed, I'm just going to say, is everything the same? They're going to say, yeah, and then we're going to change the date. And I'm going to say, here you go. But it does them no good to, if something's changed and they didn't tell me. And now they're in escrow and they can't get approved. You know, So I, I know it's in their best interest. I don't believe in running people's credit if you don't need to. So uh, but three months to that is, is plenty of it is the good Three question. months is pretty okay. much the. My next question is, um, is it just going to be, um, um, what's my question? Um, just three months, and then um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then it changes depending on the uh, the price that they want to buy for, or is it just always the same price? No. So um, they're going to be pre-approved for X dollars, right? And anytime your scenario changes, you want to talk to the lender. You want to. Yeah. So, well, that was actually my, my next question: is who's your lender? I really strongly recommend. Yes, go ahead. Besides pre-approval, I would say has your file been to underwriting because pre-approval for every lender is not equal. Yes. And if it hasn't been looked at by underwriting, then yes. And most of them have not. <clears throat> so that's a potential, you know, that's something good to know. It'll tell you how strong it is. Um, I will say that up until recently, lenders have been way too busy to pre-approve. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't, I mean, not to preach or to underwrite because they, they just didn't have the capacity, but it might be becoming more feasible right now. So I wouldn't hold it too much against so What is the desktop underwriting? Do you see so, there's DU approval? Yes. Like, DU, approval, really is DU yes. approval is important. So yeah. if you get the, a DU approval with an offer or get or give, that adds strength and value. Oh. <laughs> and what that means is if it's a conforming loan, you have everything goes through Freddie, Freddie and Fanny, and you get a desktop approval. So that's the that the means an underwriter hasn't looked at it, but based on all of the actual documentation in the file, Fannie Mae and Freddie will approve it, assuming yeah. that everything pans out. It's not a, underwritten, it's still just a pre-approval. It's still just a pre-approval, yeah. but it's a stronger pre-approval. So it's a good one. And it's only on the form, so you got a jumbo loan. There's no desktop underwriter. And pre-approval doesn't mean they, they turn in all the docs. So I always ask them, have you turned in every single required doc? Because yeah. that's so important. <clears throat> yeah. What's that? Uh, regular underwriter? A regular underwriter? Just, just, just underwriter. So once, at, once I've uh, taken in all the documentation that's needed, I've underwritten it myself first. Mm -hmm. And then I put it through an actual <laughs> underwriter. And they, they look at everything and they say, you know, they scrutinize it with a microscope and make sure that all the documentation is there and that this is an approvable one. It's an exit check. Yeah. They're, they're, the, they're God in our world. Yeah. I know my question. Was it, how does it take for them to be pre-approved? Meaning that if they talk to you, what, how, how quickly can you get back to them? So um, my personal um, <laughs> SLA uh, service level agreement is that once I have all of your documentation, your application and all of your documentation, I'll give you an answer within 24 hours. On those occasions when I can't meet that, I'll always let them know. I'll have your answer in the morning. Or give me a, give me a minute. This is harder than I thought. Okay. Oh, 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 okay. 24 hours is a quick yeah. turnaround. Okay. Yes. So do you have a question about that? Yes. Um, what would your guideline be? Um, so this is a personal level for me. Okay. So, you know, I want to buy a house. And... Um, moving forward like there isn't anything yet but i want to be ready to go yeah so but if you're how many you're when you're not going to keep running credit so say my my going now and i say okay i'm three months yes but i don't find a house for three you know after three right. months right. and i keep going 
you're just going to keep pre-approving it? I mean, basically without yes. running credit, if nothing's changed. That is correct. That's okay. Yes. Cool. So the only time I would say that you might want to delay or wait is if you are specifically working on your credit and you're waiting for some things to post. But if you're pretty much where you're going to be, there's no reason to wait. And I'm not going to keep running credit. I and is that the state? I mean, it's called state of income, right? So if it's if I'm because I'm a 1099, mm -hmm. so it's a year. Is that you're moving though? So um, that's not called state. Oh, not state. Okay. No. When you, you're going to tell me on your application how much you make, that's state of income. Right. But then right. I'm going right. to ask you for your documentation. Right. I'm going to ask since you're 1099, I'm going to ask you for at least um, one year of tax returns if you've been in business for many years. But if it's been less than five years, I need two. All right. So um, the other important thing when you're talking to the client who says they're already pre-approved, I just wrote in here, by the way, show me the money. I mean, you're not going to say it like that. <laughs> but you're going to ask them. You know, a lot of times that, that people um, come and say they're pre-approved, but do they actually have the money to buy? And that's super important. I don't even think you can write offers without that. Or if you can, you know, it certainly gives you strength if you're showing a fake statements. Um, how much you, do they do you look at for pre-approval? Don't you have to look at see how much reserves they have? Because I mean nobody's gonna go anywhere if they don't have that. So reserves are usually only required on jumbo loans, but they definitely help with the approval. Um, for example, when you've got the first time home buyer and every single dime they have is called for in, you know, in uh, closing costs and down payment, and they don't have a penny left after that, then chances are you're gonna have a hard time getting that desktop approval. They're gonna want your debt ratio to be much lower than somebody who's got hundred grand in savings or whatever, you know? So it's important. Um, okay, so you ask the question, are you approved? And the answer is no. Then that is great. Don't worry, I can introduce you to somebody who's really great. And, and do you have any concerns about getting qualified? The reason I ask that is because they're gonna start talking now and they're gonna tell you what's going on in the back of their heads. I think that a lot of times when you are talking to people and they are, you can't read them, they're, they're not giving you a lot of feedback, you're trying to find out if they're willing to buy or sell or whatever, and they're just not, you know, give me something. It's, it's, it's because there's something secretly that's bothering them that they're concerned about. And you're trying to figure out what it is. And I bet you most of the times or many of the times it's related to their finances. Right. They're not really sure if they have enough money. They're not really sure if they can afford it. They're not really sure if they're going to qualify or if, there's, if there's, this credit problem might be a, you know, a concern. So if you ask, you know, you're not pre-approved yet, okay, great, I can introduce you to someone, no problem. Do you have any concerns? That's all you really need to ask. And then they'll say, well, I, you know, I had this issue on my credit a while ago, but I think it's okay now. And, and then if they give you any kind of an answer, that's when the next um, sentence is going to be the best. Well, my lender helps people in all stages of the planning process. In fact, she specializes in credit issues. You know, okay. so I'll specialize in anything that's a concern <laughs> of theirs. You know, and, and um, can I give her your contact information and have her call you for an exploratory conversation? Very simple. Cindy, yes. I have an issue with the confidentiality. Yes. Uh, a lot of my um, clients, potential clients, are my friends. Okay. So I'm kind of feeling that they might not want to work with me because they think that I'm going to know about their financial, uh, okay. personal financial income. And I want to let them know that I have nothing to do with this. It's just you and the lender and that's confidential. Yes. All my job is to find you the price that you're qualified for. Yes. Then in your case, I would, on this last sentence, I would say to you, I have a great person to, for, to introduce you to. She keeps everything extremely confidential and she specializes in X. Yeah, because I think that's what they're worried about is that I'm going to find out about their personal yeah. income and they don't want to share it with me, of course, you know, nobody does. So I guess I'll tell them that. Yeah, and believe me, I run into that as a lender all the time. I've done loans for, I mean, for my peers, my, you know, people I know and they're, they're hesitant sometimes and I, and I have to assure them your information is going nowhere and I've seen it all and I don't judge. 
You know, so that's true. give it yeah. over. Let's have a look. Let's get you know, to a game plan. After I say that, they kind of relax and they kind of open up. Yeah. Right? They open up voluntarily. Yes. So that's good. Okay, thanks. Yes. So, um, oh. so level two questions, if you want to go a little bit deeper, um, I strongly suggest that you have what I call as a prospector. So these are the standard questions that you would need to ask in your line of business when you're talking to somebody. I've got mine and I'm gonna show it to you in one second. Um, but then the best information I ever got from somebody when I first started, I started in banking a long time ago. I was in banking for many, many, many years. And then I was in management and now I'm doing loans. And when I first got into banking, Mortgage was the most important goal I had. I knew nothing, nothing. So I took my um, loan officer out for lunch at the time and I said, we have an hour. I need to know everything there is to know about mortgage. Tell me. <laughs> and he said, he gave me the best advice that stuck with me and that's helped me ever since, which is get them talking. Because yeah, the more it. they talk and you listen, the smarter they'll think you are, <laughs> the more they'll think you know. Plus, they're constantly throwing clues at you. Mm -hmm. So just yeah. get them talking, you know, <laughs> about their dreams. <laughs> about their dreams, about their goals, about their concerns. Oh, and then right. you're listening for the clues that you need to get the sale, right? And you're jotting those down. So Listen, um, just a quick thing is they talk to us about all this stuff and their finances. And I mean, you know, some of them are they're not supposed to be. And then I don't know what I don't know. I'm not a knowledgeable person, quote unquote. That's not my expertise. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of say talk. I mean, I keep on saying the same sentence again. Talk to the lender. Talk to the lender. It's like, yeah. you know, I can't comment. I can't give any opinion. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like it, I don't feel comfortable yeah. being in that talking situation. You can say things like, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've had many clients in that situation. Okay. Um, and the, the lender that I work with can, has helped them many times. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> BS <BSN. laughs> They kind of want your, your feedback. Yeah. And your they want to know that you understand. And yeah, and you, you've been around this. And yes, I've worked with that before. You know, this is thing, these are things we can work with. But then I kind of want to know the details about it too, so I can give an idea. Or should yes. should I not get get into, get into that? No, don't no. don't get into the weeds. You'll be sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. it'll get too deep. <clears throat> okay, that makes sense. Um, I think it's really important after seventeen years of dealing. It's really important that you don't give information because let's say everybody's going to say, "What are the rates?" Don't even give them that because if you're wrong, you've got a liability there. So you just say, you know, my expertise is real estate. And you're ex I have an expert lender. And yes. to me, I don't get into anything because it could, you know what I mean? They could tell you something yeah. that actually could work against them or work against you yes. in the process. And it's just, and they're, they feel better if you tell them I have an expert lender and I'm an expert real estate lady. I don't try to get into everybody else. I have experts do. Yes. Yeah. They, they feel much better about that. And then yeah. do a conference call because they might not call it the lenders. So that's the thing. They're always running away from calling the lenders. So I keep on true. telling them. You could all, always offer to do a three-way. <clears throat> yeah, to introduce. Yeah. Um, I love an email introduction or a text introduction because I jump right in. And I just take over. That's, you know? okay. That's so, what we want. Yeah, hey, hi. You know, and once see. they hear my voice and they know that I'm not scary, you know, yes. and I'm going to let them, you know, I'm going to do whatever they want me to do. If it means leave them alone for a while, I'll leave them alone for a yes. while, you know, but I'll certainly warmly invite them to get the process started mm -hmm. and try to relieve their fears. You do have that motherly and <laughs> caring kind of a voice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I used to always say that being a manager made me a good mother. Being a mother made me a good manager. <laughs> I like that. Yes. I did have yes. a question about the previous slide. Yes. So uh, what I usually do is I introduce uh, my client if they're not be approved to a lender. Uh, I, I, from what I recall, uh, RESPA is required us to to give at least three options. Is that correct? That's, that's not a rule. It's, it's not a rule. No. Okay. okay. Do I get points for that question? <laughs> 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 Uh, <laughs> you participate. <laughs> 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 
But yeah, I mean, if it does make you feel more comfortable to give multiple, you know, referrals, you do whatever whatever way you feel comfortable. Okay. So um, there's not like no limit. Mm -mm. Yeah. But a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, you know, if I'm like lukewarm about the people I'm referring out, because by the way, P.S. I am a great resource if you need professionals. So in any line, I can refer you to people. So um, just so you know. But if it's somebody that I don't have any, you know, a strong connection with or a lot of experience with, I'll give multiple names maybe sometimes, or I'll say, but this one, try this one first. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. What kind of professionals? Question. I'm going to just answer the part to you, but that's more like for inspectors because then you have the skin in the game that you gave inspectors. Usually I do that with inspectors. I give a couple. Even though I say, oh, I work with this guy, but here's another one, you know, you interview them so that they're choosing it so it doesn't come from you. And 100% oh, okay. what you had said about saying you're, I say I'm an expert in this and I don't answer any questions. And to, I'm just kind of going around and around. Yeah. And to alleviate what you had said about their trust, it, that definitely comes up, especially when you're dealing with your sphere that's your friends and they don't want anybody to know, is that I always say when I give a lender, you know, it's it, that's their thing. And I get nothing from this. You know, I want them yes, to know that exactly. I'm not involved with your lender it's between you two i can give you the people i can you know whatever are you you know whatever i'm going to say to them but i always say that i'm a separate entity so that they don't think you know some people think i'm getting a commission okay, exactly I gave that. so that's why i say that you know that's true i say the same thing i say i have right. no benefit in this i can give you a few names so that's yeah. the thing okay i actually do always give like three names because then they feel like it's more honest number one number two i might have one guy who i said he doesn't want to get in conversation. He doesn't want to do, and they're like, they usually go with your first person. Mm -hmm. So you say this, you know, Cindy's awesome. I love working with her. She's going to take the time. This guy is just like a spiny refi, you know, yeah. they usually go with. Yeah. So, and that, that actually is better for liability for everybody too. If you give them more than one choice, you have no vested interest. Well, I'm saying too, like sometimes if they have a bank. Um, because you know, usually bankers aren't going to get what you're going to get, right? And right. so I will say, well, are you know, if you're if you're not pre-approved, you know, well, you know, you, I have somebody, I you know, blah blah expert here, and also you know, check with your bank because that's you're gonna that's something to compare. And I always do say, I don't want to use the word free, but I do in some in the certain the definition of the word free. Hey, this is like good knowledge for you to get. This doesn't cost anything. You know, but I get nothing. You know, that kind of yeah, conversation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And as far as banks go the big thing is I say promote you know you can go to the bank but you're not going to get anybody on weekends you're not going to get the same right. person when you call right you're not going to have one person on your file I mean if you fall through the last minute they're like oh sorry I said Cindy's going to be there on weekends or whatever you have a yeah. question you need you know what I mean that's a huge selling price. that is a great point because having come from a big bank <laughs> I know that your loan touches many hands and the original person that you maybe saw and talked to probably doesn't know that much about your loan. Or and they, can't, they can't bend it all. They have no yeah. other thing. This is their thing. If, if they don't even talk to you, like I, when I originally was looking at something for a refi, it was a refi a long time ago. They just say, here's our rate. Here's our thing. Blanket. You know, everybody gets the same thing. They have yeah. no personal um, anything. Yeah, and they love to drag you along thinking it's going to happen until the last minute. They don't put it in writing. Say, it's like, oh, yeah. they gave me 1%. No, just, oh, now it's 5%. When yeah. they finally come back at the end and it's like, <laughs> yeah, I just had a Wells Fargo deal back out after pre approval and the whole thing. They're like, oh, I'm like, yeah. yep. So basically, they are. are banks more expensive? No, banks tend to have. Um, relationship pricing sometimes so they, they tend to sometimes have better pricing not for me mm -mm. my bank i've been in my same even my same mortgage i had for 20 years no yeah but you, you never know you yeah. never know because they turn that on and off on the day too but, um but um a lot of people are just comfortable going with their banks but frankly they are the toughest entities to work with mm -hmm. when it comes There's to loans you don't have options very are inflexible they're they have bad service. I mean, it's, it's, they don't care if your loan falls through. That's the other thing. Right. They're just the numbers. I need two hundred this month. Right. I don't care if you're in my one million dollar club and your best client. They don't care. That's the Huge. worst thing. They really don't care if your loan. And, and I, for me, I'm like, you know, shock to me was, you know, my, I think my score is an eight thirty or something. I mean, I'm, I'm excellent credit, and like they, like what? Like it was, yeah. 
Oh, if you're self-employed, yeah. I wasn't that, but still, <laughs> it's a wrap. Yeah. If I was an agent um, and my client had uh, a B of A or Wells Fargo or whatever approval, I'd say to them, "Good luck. I consider double lapping just to be on the safe side, you know, just as a backup." You know. So, what do you say to clients when they when I said that before and they're very worried about their you know credit yeah. and I don't want them running yet again? Like, what yeah. what is a good so um, as far as that goes, it's funny, the people with the best credit scores are the ones who worry about that the most. <laughs> so <Yeah. scary. laughs> because they work so hard to get, yeah. you know, but a, a credit inquiry really has like maybe one to three point ding. So it's not very much, number one. Number two is if it happens in a, a very short period of time, it's all considered one, just mm -hmm. like with the car loan. If you do, and I want to say it's like two, three weeks, something like that. You can do multiple mortgage inquiries, multiple car loan inquiries, and it'll only count as one inquiry during that time period. Um, but uh, something as important as mortgage, it's worth the couple of extra points that it might cost you to get a second inquiry. I wouldn't go all over town, but one more would if it's something that somebody can trust with. It's so, that's so how far into the transaction is it safe for them to you know, check interest rates and compare to a point where it doesn't start affecting you know, the loan process? The so they, nobody should ever have to get their credit pulled to get a rate quote unless they absolutely have no idea what their credit score is and in that case they should just go ahead and get pre-approved somewhere what i think how i would personally do it is uh, okay i'm thinking about doing this transaction the scenario looks like this i'm going to call several lenders and i'm going to say here's the scenario what's your rate and i'm going to see what the responsiveness is what the service level is who picks up the phone and who doesn't and then what's the number that they give me and if all the numbers are within the same ballpark, um, cool. If there's outliers, I'd be suspicious of the guy that's super low, and I wouldn't touch the ones that's super high. But I'd go with ballpark because then um, once you find the one, now now you got the the rate is in the ballpark, and you want to pick the person that you connected with the best mm -hmm. at that point, and then stick. With so it should be at the beginning. This should, this should not happen within a transaction. No, and there's one thing that drives me insane is when um, I have somebody who I've pre-approved and now um, you know the agent comes back and they say, our escrow's um, opened, you know, where the offer's accepted. And I'm like, yay. And then the client starts rate shopping. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, well, that's what they do, right? Yeah, they, they waste like several days while they're doing it. We're haggling back and forth over rates. We're losing time. And then, um, you know, finally they may make a decision. And sometimes they'll go with somebody else to save up, you know, an eighth of a point. And it's, you know, and I know that they could have just been better off staying, <laughs> but I get aggravated. I've been let them go sometimes. Well, the risk of that, because if you don't block, let's say you do wait, and now you absolutely have to have a lock. If the rate's up uh, that day, you're in big trouble. So, I mean, it's really risky to, to shop the rates yeah. once you've started because there's no guarantee that the interest isn't going up. And about the interest rate, I think someone was asking about, you have your pre-approval and the interest rates grow, go up. Yeah. Your, your, your line that you're approved for is going to stay the same. And I'm sure Cindy, let's say you're offering a, you're approved for 800 mm -hmm. and they're looking at a $600,000 house. She's going to give you an approval for 600. So they don't know that you're approved up to 800 right. um, or whatever, you know, every time you offer. So I do want to say one thing about rate because this is um, this is important. There are many rate sensitive clients out there, and this is sort of a little bit of a commercial here. But uh, the one of the big reasons I came to the company that I'm with now, House America Financial, I just started here in October. Um, I was happy where I was, and um, but I got pulled in, and I'm really happy I did because of this Keller Williams relationship, and also because. Um, of what they do with their rates. First of all, they're always going to be in the ballpark, if not better. Their rates are very, very good here. Um, but most importantly, what's rare is that they allow me to shop for rates. So if I find a better rate out there and, and I can broker it out and get a better deal, I'm totally allowed to, which is very rare. That's awesome. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So. 
So this is what my what I call a prospector. This this is what I use when I get that phone call and the clients. Um, hello. <laughs> And, and I always ask them, you know, great, hi, you know, who referred you? How can I help you? What, what is it that you're looking to do? And I, I just engage them with, tell me what you're looking to do. And then I start making notes. And then, and then I, yeah, I, I'll ask you questions at the end, you know, whatever you haven't told me. All right. So they'll give me all my clues. I'll start filling in my sheet. And all of this stuff is what I need to know to price, just so you know, and to figure out what product to go into. So um, ownership is important. Is it going to be your primary home, a second home, an investment property? Are you looking at a single family, a condo, or a multi-unit? Why do you think that one's important? Because the rates are different. The rates are different and condos, HOAs. Yes. Yes. On a multi um, multi-unit, you're going to get income that helps you. On a condo, you're going to have to pay an HOA that hurts you because we count that in your debt. So that's super important. And um, all of these things affect your rate FICO score. I always say, you know, do you happen to know your FICO score? And um, most of the time people do. And sometimes they say no idea. And sometimes they say, oh, it's pretty good in the sixes. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's three credit bureaus. They all have different yeah. costs to them, I guess. They do. So you just ballpark. Yeah, and you can't rely on what credit karma or you know your your bank <laughs> statement tells you, okay. but it does give you a sense. You right. know, it does right. give you it puts right. you in the ballpark. Um, um, something really important for a new agent when you're putting an offer on any condo, you have to make sure when you do your loan contingency, don't release it until they give you the condo docs or until you get them because the loan will be disqualified depending on how much the reserves are. And all of the condo information, like the minutes, they need to see that. And you can't release a contingency if you haven't seen that because yeah. mm -hmm. that could kill but you. Usually, ask that awesome. up front from the agent who sent it. Yeah, like, exactly. So, Brian, that's something. That's just, is there any problem with the uh, or loans on the HOA? If they don't tell you, you call them ahead of time and you can get that information. It could save you some time ahead of Sure. But I mean, make sure you get the lender the docs before you release that contingency. And also FHA, a lot of buildings are not approved. And so your loan will not be approved. You yes. have to, right? I mean, a lot are not FHA approved. Yeah, that's so right. But they just put that in there, you know, words that really that's 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 really that's 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 Yeah. And do yourself a favor, always call the lender before you release a loan contingency. That's super important. I remember one time I called um, the buying agent and I said to them, you know, I know the loan contingency date is tomorrow, but um, we haven't heard back on the condo yet. So can you just try to stall it until we do? And she said, oh my God. She goes, I haven't made this mistake in 17 years. I already released it. And I was like, okay, don't panic. We'll, we'll be fine. <laughs> Luckily we were. But, you know, but it's like, it's a scary moment. I want to ask a question about that because I've had a lot of lenders when I'm saying I'm going to really, I almost feel like they don't, I'm not even supposed to ask. And then I'm releasing the contingency, you know, and they're, and I've had that blanket statement. I'm not allowed, you know, I'm not gonna, like, they don't want to give me their opinion or whatever, but I'm like, well, you know, like they're kind of yeah. waving me out there that I really don't have that. Is that, is that something that you feel comfortable that you say? I mean, what, how are you? 100%. Wow. If, they, if they're not comfortable, yeah, if they're not comfortable, <laughs> it's because they're not comfortable. They're not that good of a loan officer. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> okay. And, and I'll tell you if yeah. I have any doubts, you know, or if there's anything that's concerning me. You know, I'd be like, I'm 100. And I can't tell, I, I've had like squeaky clean clients, and we get to the end, and we were just waiting for that final approval, and we couldn't do it because I don't know, there was a delay in getting the homeowner's insurance, whatever, something like that. And then they asked, you know, can we release? And I'd be like, you know, I feel very comfortable, but I would feel way more comfortable if I had that final approval. So if you can hold off for a day or two, great. If you can't, I'm going to go on the line and say, yeah, it'll be fine. Second reviews have been tough. Yeah. Or second yeah. reviews taking way longer. Yeah, sometimes. That's an excellent yeah. point. Right? So, yeah. so pre-approval is not a laughing in the, the, the rate. 
No. They lock the rate when they do what? When the offer is accepted? When, when yes, when you're an escrow. When you're an escrow. Yes, typically. And anytime. You could technically float till you get to the end, but it's too scary. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't want to do that. There, there's a fee for locking it, right? No. No? No. 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 You, you just go past it, your expiration. I mean, they just have to make the commitment to lock it. Yes, yeah. and and if they lock it too short and you go over, then you have to pay extension fees. Yes. Yes. Generally, what's the length of locking it? Is it thirty days or longer? It depends on the escrow. So uh, most escrows are thirty days, so most locks are thirty days. But if it's a forty-five day or a sixty-day escrow, then we'll lock accordingly. Now, if they go extension, how long can you extend that lock window? Oh, uh, you can extend for a pretty long time. I want to say, I know it's a month is the limit on jumbos. I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. So it's to, it's to advantage to check for the trend of the market is it's going down, it's going up, to lock it before everybody is going up. If you don't know what the market is doing, or if you feel like it's going up, you want to lock it up. Absolutely. If you feel strongly that the market's coming down or it could go lower, then and you, you float. And you want to float. Yeah, but whenever you're in escrow, the time flies. So I really 99% of the times lock a salary. Yeah. And these days it looks like rates will be going up anyways, but what if rates did come down after you lock? Can you take you can't take the lower rate or no. can't you? No, no. that's what lock is you. You're locked. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's pointless. I get people all the time who uh, ask me about the rates. What's today's rate? And my answer is, I don't know, and I don't care. You're locked. <laughs> or, I don't want to get into the argument with you. Yeah, what if they fail and go to another lender, though? They could. Yeah, because, like, I know if you're shopping for a car, if rates go lower, they'll give you the lower rate. Mm -hmm. uh, but not with that. I mean, they'd have to go down by a whole point yeah. in order for us to do any renegotiating. And that almost never happens. But it can. Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out on my prospector sheet here. Obviously, I want to know, you know, what's their price range and what kind of down payment. Um, I always want to know who they're working with because I have so many great agents I can refer them to if they're not working with anyone yet. And then um, this is first time home buyer or non occupant co borrower. Sometimes there are rules um, depending on the loan product that. Uh, affect that. So that's why I asked that. And, and most importantly for you guys, on the departing residence question. So client owns a house now, they want to, um, they're, they're going to buy a new home, they want to get pre approved for the new home, do they have to sell their existing home first? And a lot of times people cannot qualify for both their existing homes and the new home. However, there's so many ways now that we can look at it, that we can try to get them qualified. We can do all kinds of creative um, things. And, uh, and there's a lot of, different, especially older clients. I love working with older clients and self-employed because there's so many different ways around um, what we can do with them. Don't assume anything. If you're, if you, someone comes to you with a pre-approval that says I have to sell my home or I can't buy another one, then ask them to come to me for a second opinion because there's ways around that. Um, all right, so then, I mean, again, if you want to get deep in the weeds um, on income situations, you know, this is, these are our options on income. Are you self-employed? Are you salaried or W-2? Are you retired? Um, do you have a lot of assets? If somebody has a lot of money, no work, no job whatsoever, especially if they're older, we can do things, <laughs> you know, lead talks. Um, and, you know, if the client, if you ask them about their income and they say there's, they're doing a lot of things, it sounds complicated. Those are the ones you especially want to um, have uh, pre-approved because, you know, they, those are tough. And people who are recently divorced, these are situations where, um, you know, these all require different types of loan products, different rules. Um, it's, these are things that I need to know when I'm talking to a client. You don't necessarily need to know them, but if it came out in your conversation, um, make a note of how they're getting their income source. 
um, some common challenges that we run into. Uh, people with credit issues, um, there are, well, I'll get into the solutions in a second. People who either have low or no down payment or reserves. Um, people who are first time home buyers. This one can be very tough when there's no room, no wiggle room anywhere. You know, their debts as high as it could possibly go. Their income is, there's not a penny more I can get on squeeze out of the income. They don't have any reserves. They don't have any assets. Those are the toughest ones because a lot of times I can just get them pre-approved for 350,000, let's say. And then um, they come in and they want to buy a place for 375 and you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe. And then, so then they, you, you get an approval at the 375, but then you're in escrow and something happens, you know, like that. You know, the, the homeowner's insurance ends up being higher, and you know, that just brings them over the oh, there's, these are killers to me. So, be careful with these first time home buyers. And if you've got any, yes, I have a question if, if the first time home buyer does not show a lot of income, they have debt, they usually can maybe bring the co borrower. Yes, does the co borrower need to be on, can they not be on the title just? Be part of the mortgage, and then the borrower would be the primary. That's correct. That's, that's our non economic co borrower. So, that um, if there's if we're struggling here with these first timers, I always look to do you have any co uh, co signers you can put on here? Is there any as, uh, access to gift bonds? Because those are two of the, the best ways we can try to fix this. So, with a co borrower, they cannot be on title, they don't have to be, they don't have to be on title of their co borrower. Is that you? No. Thank you. <laughs> and let's say that you wanted to co-borrow for your kids. Um, if that was the case, then have your kids make the mortgage payments because once they've been somebody, the other person on the loan is making the payments for a year, it doesn't, we don't have to necessarily gain you if you do a transaction later. Okay. I have a question about that. Yes. Yes. funds They have to be um, decided before in the beginning of the process, correct? Not like. No. No? They don't have to be. No. They have to be documented. So. But any. But any funds that they have have to be in the account before they start the loan process. Yeah. There has to be. They have to be able to document they have enough to close. The correct. Account. And if that requires. Can't show funds, up. Like. Yeah. If that requires gift funds, then it requires Because I literally had clients who had like cash under their mattress. And that was like, and I had to prove that they were burdening the lender and go to their work. And it was like, yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up because cash under the mattress is not usable. Right. Any not cash usable. has to be seasoned for two months. We have to have a paper trail right. for two months. So don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I had a first time home buyer who um, they, the agent came to me and said, Great news, we're in escrow. And I said, Terrific. And um, I said, Whatever you do, don't release contingencies early. He goes, Wait, I thought you said I can do this with no contingencies. And I'm like, No, <laughs> I didn't say that. And he goes, But I did. And I said, Okay, we'll make the best of it. Wow. And then, um, it, it, I was biting my nails through the whole thing. But the, the thing that really scared me the most was he and the client ended up owing um uh, the irs 10 grand in back taxes and so he said no problem i'll pay it i said okay great and so i said to him, give me the documentation to show you know that you paid it and he goes well i just um used cash and i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me that and so uh, to get to figure out we went back to his um through his checkbook for a year we found a year old deposit of ten thousand ish dollars and we used that as our documentation <laughs> and it was like oh my god killing me i thought the loan was going to fall off for that what a dumb thing can you use it can you potentially waive the financing if you have a new approval Mm. But like, can you? Is that strong enough to potentially like use that as like a pre-approval and then waive the finance? I don't know. I've heard of like ways where you oh, can waiving the loan contingency. Waiving the loan. What did I say? 
Finance. I would probably only do that on a cash offer, right? Yeah. Only on a cash offer. So there's not really ways where you can feel secure and safe enough where you've done all the investigation before so that you can actually waive the um, There is one, only one that I can think of that I feel that comfortable with. And that's somebody who uh, was already in process and approved on the loan and then decided they didn't want that property. And then they went into another property and I already knew that they were clean. So that's the second property they went and with no contingencies. But that's all of that stuff. Just talk to the lender and see what their opinion is. If they don't have an opinion or they won't, um, you know, venture one, they're not a good lender, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> okay, other challenges. Low documented income, departing residents that must be sold and on that unrealistic expectation. We've kind of already talked about all of these. And then common solutions. Okay, let's talk about credit. So if somebody's got credit issues, here's how I like to go about it. Um, let me see if I can rescore you. That's one thing. Um, if you can do, a, if you're a DIYer, try Experian Boost. You know, that's kind of like your own, you know, the uh, layman can try to rescore themselves with that. Um, the, one of the easiest fixes I've found is if, say, you're a kid and you've got a parent or somebody in your family who's got really good credit, try to ask them to add you as an authorized signer on something. You don't have to give them a card or tell them. I have my, my two kids are each authorized signers on like my oldest credit cards, but I didn't tell them. <laughs> they get to have the benefit, yes. Um, and then if we have to, sometimes we can manually underwrite the loans um, if the credit is below the minimum. But most of the times, here's how I operate when I have somebody that I have to say no to for whatever reason it's a lot of times it's credit oriented, is I'll tell them, okay, we can't do it right now because your credit is below minimum or whatever, but here's your game plan. I want you to do, you know, do these things uh, based on the credit rescore, fix your credit. I want you to save some money and then, um, you know, come back to me. Well, let's regroup in three months. You know, there's always going to be a very specific game plan to anybody who doesn't get along from me today. I, I've had have a recommendation for an inexpensive company. Lexington Law will do like a monthly. They actually have lawyers who will send the letters out to the companies and get get the credit fixed and they're like extremely reasonable several of my clients have used have used them and brought the score up like if you have like you know what i mean you didn't pay a credit card and it's really low or whatever um defaulted on a loan it's just because lawyers are astronomically expensive and a waste of money i think for that but this is just a, an affordable way for a client to get credit up like yeah. just that i work so it's called lexington law lexington law yeah and you can do a monthly thing and they'll address like so many of your problems a month but i find that when the lawyer sends the letter is different than like i'll say hey yeah. like i was in literally in hurricane katrina and i had to like write banks all the time they didn't care no but then you know what i mean if you have a lawyer sending the letter then they all of a sudden pay attention and get back you know Okay, if you have anything derogatory or anything like that. It can be anything, yeah. They can they can do it. It's just like a low monthly fee. It's really reasonable compared to getting like a letter or something. That's great. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um other solutions for people with low cash. There's lots of low money down programs. Um, we already talked about co-signers and gifts and, and how I give people a game plan. But the low money down, uh, just so you know. 3% is typically the minimum um, that's for a first time home buyer for, a, uh, for any conforming loan, 3.5% for um, FHA. Um, if it's a high balance loan, it's 5% is the minimum. Uh, most jumbos are 10%. I mean, just I'm throwing these numbers out at you just to give you a, a flavor. But um, yes, there are zero money down programs, there are down payment assistance programs. I don't do them because they're hard to find, they're hard to qualify for. And frankly, the people that I've tried to work with with those in the past usually have so many problems mm -hmm. that it's just never, never pans out into an actual loan. So uh, what's considered Jambu nowadays? Nowadays, it's over in LA County, it's over 970,000. No, 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 no. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is different. Yeah. So see me after because I don't know it off the top. No worries. But it's good. It's a little bit lower than that. Yeah. Oh, VA is zero down. Yes. Yeah. VA loans are yes. I can do those. VA loans are fabulous. Yes. So anybody who's a veteran, for sure, for sure, for sure, make sure I'm aware of that because those are great loans. Right, those mini great rates and then no down payment, right? No down payment usually mm -hmm. and great rates. Yeah, <laughs> definitely the way to go. I, I, yeah. I do have a client yeah. that, that has What's that? that's a VA. That's so I would for you to use it. Yeah. They're much more. They used, this young lady was just saying how VA loans used to be a pain and no sellers would take them, but now they're much more streamlined and easier to process, correct? They are. Um, a bit complicated. They're one of the set. So um, I put them in the same category as reverse mortgages. People, lenders don't generally understand that. There's a lot of training that could be them. So that's that's probably the only reason they're not done as much is because I mean in the beginning before I knew how to do them, I would do the same thing. Well, the rates are just as good on the uh, regular loans. <laughs> you know, let's let's just put you in that one. You know, that's going to be better for you. Well, they used to have longer closing times, but now they're better, right? Yeah, they're good. They used to be like 60 days and no one wanted that. So, yeah. but now they're regular, right? Like yeah. 30, 40 days. Yes. Condos are okay with VAs? Yeah. yeah. Okay. As long as the Some HOA is approved, you yeah. need approval yeah, you for FHA and VA. Yeah. Oh. separate approval. Oh, I see. And that's the fifth, first thing we can check is do a condo book up. So, oh, I see. Is there some in part for VA loan? No. Sometimes. Oh, Only. Yeah, so sometimes. it's usually zero. However, um, I remember the first VA loan I did, I think the purchase split was like a million and a half dollars or something like that. I was thinking to myself, no way. Yeah. Oh, so you have to come so, out with the closing, the closing down money. The VA loan as well. So there's a formula. And you get whatever that formula is, and anything over that you pay. So that's how the, the client was able to use a VA loan for a million and a half dollar purchase. Because he did have to come in with some down I mean, money. Typically, there's not. Sometimes you can, let's say, the asking price is a million dollars. Say the closing cost is about 3%. You can give them a million 30 and use a 30,000 for the closing cost if you want. But is there a cost? Does the VA cover the closing costs? Yes. Okay. So the, the VA gives you um, uh, having a senior word on the word um, the the benefit, you know, whatever the benefit is, and it gets to go towards your closing costs and down payment, which oftentimes will be a hundred percent. Not always. It's different on appraisals for VA and FHA loans. They use their, their own appraisers. Um, FHA, the, FHA, there is an FHA appraisal. VA, I can't remember if VA has their They're own. They're looking appraisal. for different stuff than a regular yeah. conforming appraiser. They look for different things. Yeah. You don't like ask me the why. The roof. It's, I think they, um, like FHA, I think might have some termite kind of rules. They can get yeah. termite report. Yeah. So I think that's one reason I think typically if you're trying to select a buyer, you might prefer conventional over FHA or VA yeah. just because of the appraisal. Yeah. Um, anytime that you're putting in offers, I think that most agents are going to shy away from the government loans. If they can, yeah. If, if they, they have can. lots of choices. Yes. Yeah. Any quick questions? Did you say conventional now? It's like 3% down? For first time home buyer. Oh, wow. Yes. The one about a, a, a like you're buying it, not a um, vacation home, but you're buying not a first time. Second home? That's, yeah, and it's um, the standard. Which is what? 20%. Well, anything under 20% is going to, or over 20%. Under 20% is going to require mortgage insurance. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. On a conventional? Mm -hmm. Wow. And even the three percent downs require mortgage insurance, but but yeah, I mean, but the, the down payment is twenty percent. I thought mortgage insurance was only on FHA. 
So how much is a mortgage and payment insurance? Is there like a percentage of how much it is? Of the it depends on, on the FHA, the maximum mortgage insurance is 0.85%. Wow. But I have seen mortgage insurance costing people as much as $500 a month sometimes wow. if they have like not very good credit and you know they're self-employed and they, their debt ratio is high and you know if they have a lot of the negative factors then the, the mortgage insurance gets higher and it gets lower if they have a lot of positive factors like multiple borrowers w2 employment good credit score those will give you a nice low mi so they need to avoid that by putting in 20 percent above of course if possible yes yeah. you think it's going to cost another eight eight percent in general, on average, that's the FHA one. Eight percent. You just said eight point eight percent for the FHA. Oh, 0. 0.85 percent. Oh, that's a lot. Point eight five. Okay, point eight five five percent of the loan. Okay, so that's big. That's a big difference. Yeah, big difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Departing residents, we already talked about. Same with the unrealistic expectations. If the client just please let me that you get anything anytime, then we can make them come in because they can't. They're they're going to be complicated for sure. And just so you know, when I'm looking for a loan for somebody, this is kind of the the pyramid that I go through. So um, I'm going to always first start with: Do they qualify for a full down program? Because that's going to be the best pricing, and that's what um, going to be in house and everything else. Otherwise, if not, then do we have to go to an alt doc program? Do they have one year of taxes only? Do they have a bunch of assets? Do do they can they get retirement distributions? If they can't get that, then I'll look at, can we work with the bank statement program? Are you actually making money and putting it in your bank account, but you're not reporting it? Then we'll go to that one. Um, <laughs> if they um, aren't necessarily showing it in their bank account or their tax returns, but they still want to buy an investment property, we can go into the DSCR program. I long forgotten what that stands for, but it's basically an investor loan. And if you, as long as your expense is no greater than your, um, uh, how much your, the money you make in rent is going to be equal to or lower than the, the uh, or higher than the uh, expense, then you're going to be able to get this loan. So they don't even look at how much money you make. They just look at does the, the property cash flow if it does, you can have a loan. There's some, also something called a no ratio loan, which very few lenders offer. And that's another thing that this company that I'm with now offers. It's like a stated income loan. You do have to have good income or good um, credit score, and you have to have, um, um, what do you call it? Um, Oh, I'm having my second senior moment of the day. Um, shoot. It'll come back to you as soon as I walk away from it. <laughs> but, but, oh, dying. Thank you. See? <laughs> That's how it works. As long as you hit half the down payment, you've got some money. So you can't come to me with only 3% down and no income and you get this program. But if you've got 30% down and a good credit score, Sure, we can talk. Mm -hmm. And then uh, reverse mortgages. You can do reverse mortgages for purchases. I was surprised when I heard that, but you certainly can. So if you are 60 or older and you've got a lot of assets or you're selling a house that has um, a lot of equity, you can go straight into a purchase as a, a reverse mortgage. And what that means is that you will have no mortgage payments ever. Wow. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a conventional question? Yes. You were saying it's 20%, you're going to put 20% or less, it's going to be PMI on that primary mm -hmm. margin. How long does that stay on the loan? So that kind of depends. Like FHA, it's on there forever. Right. But if it's a regular conventional loan, it's they'll go till it becomes 78% equity, and then they'll take it off. And, but if you refi, it's taken off, right? If you have yeah. equity. Okay. Yeah. Anybody who gets MI, they're going to refinance. Yeah. And so, you know, when I have clients who really try to, you know, 
do whatever they can to avoid the MIM. Like, you know what, don't kill yourself over it. You're going to refinance in a few years and don't worry about it. Just get in the property. Yes. Just going to refinance. Let's say they just walk in a rate as a new um, homeowner. Mm -hmm. They have how many months to refinance? Um, they Okay, so they should be in the property for at least six months. Okay. Uh, if it's a jumbo loan, you're probably going to want to be in there for a year in most cases because they're going to use, usually when you refinance, you're going to be using, want to use the current value as opposed to the, the number that you bought the house for. So that's the why less. you have to wait. Yeah, but there's, all, there's some flexibility there. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. This is what the handoff looks like. So you send me, you send me and the client an introductory email or text saying, hey, you know, just want to introduce you to Cindy, she's a great lender, you know, um, call her when you need her. Now, if their information is not, if their phone number is not on that text or email, then I'm going to e immediately email back and say, hi, you know, here I am, you know, I'm happy to help. Please um, write me back and give me your phone number or call me direct and here's my number. Um, but if it's, uh, if it's there, great. I'll just pick up the phone and I'll call and I'll immediately come back to you and let you know what's happening. Um, once I talk to the client, um, I just want to have a five minute conversation. I know some people don't like to talk on the phone, but I need the first five minutes just to get some basic information. And then from then on, we can text or email whatever you want to do. Um, but that's when I fill out my prospector. And based on the information I get from that, I, I have what I need to get the loan done. So I send them, them an email that has the link to my online application. It's a question and answer type thing, super easy to fill up and do it on their phone. And then I tell them what documents I need to analyze their income. And then I update the agent. I let them know we've been in touch. I sent them the list. Um, I'll let you know when I hear back. And then we start the game of, of you know, <laughs> did they fill out the application or not, you know? And so this is where um, usually I'll make a couple of attempts um, after I send them the, the application and needs list. If they haven't responded by then, um, then I'll let you know, you know, hey, do you want to take a turn and see, see if you can get them to fill out the application? And then you, you tell me and I'll take the next turn or whatever, so. Um, that my friends cindy can i just have this email though is that um your presentation can yes. you attach yes. to, to an email yeah. for us that's the business program yes. yeah that's for the yeah, yeah, yeah i did i wasn't yes. sure if she's gonna send yeah, that. I, I that yeah I everybody that. on there will get a copy of these uh, things great um so if i still don't get anything from anybody you know i've sent them the thing they're still not sending it back to me i'll drip on them i'll call them from time to time the important thing is i never give up I hope you never give up yeah, sure. because someday, you know, I get calls from people from way in the past a lot because they've heard my voice, they're comfortable, and when they're ready, they'll call me, and that's me. So, um, who do you think should get this? Cindy, just quick question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, I just, for my for my situation as far as just a quick thing is for my buyers to kind of motivate them what i'm doing is i'm just right away getting them to speak to a lender because a lot of them are not so motivated now because of they're waiting for the market yeah so i mean i don't know if that's the right technique so okay here's the story you tell because i hear this all the time on those clients especially on okay. buyers, first time buyers yeah first time buyers they're like i don't know i'm gonna wait you know the market's crazy right now okay but you know what's gonna happen you are one day gonna see the perfect house it's just gonna come to you you're gonna see it on an email you're gonna see it on the street as you're driving by and you haven't even begun that's it and the house is gonna go like that you don't even get a shot get ready have a shot. Yeah, and I'm just putting them on an automatic email. I know it's not a good thing to do, you guys. I know. Oh, but then they're not been pre approved yet. Yeah, they're, oh, they're not. So what? You, you're, you got your foot in the door. Yeah. And, gonna, and you need to tell them where <clears throat> What she just said. Sorry, this is my place. <clears throat> That's how you start. Yeah. I, I do that all the time, and then they haven't even. <clears throat> as long as you're not sending the emails daily. <clears throat> no, I do it like. 
separate, like um, one day yes, one day no, three, three days, three days a week, sporadically. You, you just you want to you've got to figure out what the magic formula is, right? You, I've got to figure it out for me. How often is often enough for them not to forget me, but not to be annoying? Yeah. And I send them a text once in a while, just saying, "Call me if you need questions." Yeah. Let me talk to your lender. I mean, a zillion kind of things I create, yeah. but not and once a week. Hey guys, who should I give this to? <laughs> do business cards. Okay, yeah, so we can do business cards. Oh, business cards. And I should have just did that to you. Oh, uh, I've got this thing too. I can do a um, yeah. Yeah, you know, this is not busy. So I guess you can play my business cards. All right, I'm not looking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I mean, Joey. Joey. Glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Joey. Joey. Thank you so much, Cindy. Wait, how did that happen? I know. Wait, what? They must have done some juices. I I was I was Welcome. Uh, <laughs> 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 